Good day. Welcome back to Creation Talk. My name is Joe, and with me is Dr. Jonathan Safati from a remote location. Good day, so everyone. Dr. Safati, yes, hi. So today we are going to discuss an interesting topic: how the dinosaurs fit on the ark. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, John, before we even address this question, we need to um, answer the question, right? Another question before that: How do we know that dinosaurs were even on the ark? Well, that's an important point because there are a few people who obviously don't read our material who say, well, dinosaurs became extinct because they couldn't fit on the ark and were all drowned in the flood. This is clearly false, according to the Bible. Yes, yeah, so what are some of the reasons we get from the Bible why this is not true? I mean, I think it's, it's a logical deduction from both the propositions of Scripture, which are our found, foundational axioms, plus things which are indisputable, uh, not disputed by evolutionists or creationists. Well, one thing is that dinosaurs once existed. Now, what the Bible says is they were created on day six, because day six is when the beasts of the earth were created. So dinosaurs are a subset of beasts of the earth. So they were, they were clearly created, they were clearly existed. And yes. um, since they were drowned in the flood, as we know from the fossils, they must have been alive when Noah was building the ark. But then God said, you've got to take every, two of every kind of, of land creature, land vertebrate animal on the ark. And if dinosaurs were alive, it follows that the dinosaurs must have been part of the animals that Noah brought on the ark. You can't escape the logic there. Uh, God didn't say take everything except for the dinosaurs. He said everything, yeah, two of every kind, one male, one female, every kind of land vertebrate animal, seven, of, seven pairs of the clean ones. So you can't escape the dinosaurs must have been on the ark. Yes, that's right. And I think we also believe that most of the fossils that we, found, that we find today were formed by the flood. So they were there before the flood. But we also read in Job chapter 40 um, about behemoth. And mm-hmm. uh, we know that behemoth is described as an, a huge creature, the largest creature, that land creature that God creates. has a tail like a cedar tree and eats grass like an ox. And mm-hmm. that only fits a dinosaur. Yes, clearly. And um, we know that Job was actually written after the flood. Oh, absolutely. Be- yeah. Yes. No because question. Because there are a few passages that describe how God had judged the wicked with a worldwide flood. So if Job knew about dinosaurs, that means dinosaurs survived the flood, that means dinosaurs had to be on the ark. Right. So let's address another question. How did all the dinosaurs fit on the ark? Well, don't you think a lot of people, a lot of the critics of the ark and the flood story will say, well, the ark's too small to fit uh, all the animals, but they can't tell us how many animals had to go on or how big the ark was. Or how do you know unknown number of animals couldn't fit on an unknown sized ark? Well, that's not really, really much of an argument. So we've got to know how many uh, animals were on the ark and how big the ark was, don't we? So how many animals were there, Jono? Well, I, I think dinosaurs? it doesn't depend on whether you call the kind or what do you think the kind was. Well, I, mean, I think most of us would agree the kind was bigger than a species. That's what, that's very clear because uh, there's been speciation in modern times. Um, in fact, creationists before Darwin understood the kinds must have been bigger than varieties and species. So Charles Lyell taught fixity of species, but that's not what the Bible says. So now John Woodbury has a classic book in 96 called Noah's Ark, a feasibility study. And to be as generous to the evolutionists as possible, he said the kind was the genus. Mm-hmm. Let's just take kind as genus. And he found that you only need about 16,000 animals total if the kind was as small as the genus. And the ark is plenty big to hold 16,000 animals. Now, if a kind was a family, as you and I argue in our Titans book, and most creationists, are, I mean, answers to Genesis, the um, Institute for Creation Research, we would tend to agree that kind was more or less the family level. Not always, but roughly the family. And if it's not always the family, that's the fault of the man-made classification system, not the fault of the Bible. Okay, so say so kind is family, then only about 2,000 animals on the ark. Okay, so how big was the ark then? Well, I mean, that's what I mean. I think, I think you know, the Bible is very clear about it. I mean, God was very specific. This is not a fairy story. God it gives specific dates of when the flood came and specific size of the ark. And these sizes actually match up with a very, very stable vessel. And if it says 300 cubits, here's a cubit. Mm-hmm. Length is 300 cubits, width is 50, which is wider than six lanes of the American interstate system and the height is 30 cubits which is taller than a four-story building yes it's longer than a football field but it's a big arc and when you calculate uh 
it could be the same as a capacity of 340 semi-trailers, or what do you call them here, tractor trailers, semi-trailers, what you say here, don't they? or articulated mm-hmm. lorries, they say in the UK. They're big vessels, they're big, big trucks. They can carry 300 sheep each weighing about 55 kilograms, which is about 120 pounds in, in American customer units, okay, so 55 <laughs> kilograms. And so the R could carry 100,000 sheep-sized animals. That's a lot. Yes, that's right. And I think we also wrote in the book that only about 11% of creatures are actually bigger or the same size as a sheep. So even though dinosaurs, some of them were really big, a lot of Mm -hmm. them were really small. And we also explained that average size of a dinosaur is about the size of a large cow. That's about right, yeah. I mean, think about things, big lizards that you think of are much tinier than most of the birds you can think of, most of the mammals are rats and rabbits. Um, They're much smaller than a sheep. Mm-hmm. And yet those are most of the animals of that sort of tiny animals. And as you say, only um, a few animals were bigger and the average full-grown size was a cow, as you say, yeah. But who said the animal, the dinosaur has, had to be full-grown? It is true because, you know, like in my talk, I always ask a question and say that if Noah was going to bring two of every animal to reproduce after the flood, will he bring grandma and grandpa or will he maybe bring two teenagers? Like everybody laughed because they know that it's a young one that will reproduce. And in That's the book, true. we mentioned that if the dinosaurs are young, they will be much smaller. So we explained that something like an S-shaped growth curve. What's that yeah. exactly? Well, I mean, it means the same like an S goes like this, you see. So the the animals started off growing slowly and then they sort of shot up at a certain time. We could say it's a teenage growth spurt type of thing. And then they leveled off after a very rapid uh, growth spurt. And you can tell that because scientists have actually looked at growth rings in dinosaur bones and found they must have fit that pattern. Every dinosaur that they looked at had this growth pattern, including the bigger Patasaurus. So who said the animals had to be uh, on board once they'd finished their growth spurt? Why not have them on just before their growth spurt, in fact, a year before they started their growth spurt, then they get off the ark and they're basically ready to go through their growth spurt. So instead of a 30-ton Apatosaurus, you have a one-ton Apatosaurus pair. If the average size of a dinosaur, like we say, is the size of a large cow, and then you have a young dinosaur, it would have been much smaller than that. And so in our book, we explain that there's more than enough space for animals, food, and, um, you know, even extra space for living quarters and things like that. But, you know, in Genesis 6, 621, it says this, God told Noah, you are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store away mm-hmm. as food for you and for them. Yeah. So how much food would they have to store? Do Let's... they have the bigger water? This is an interesting yeah. thing. It does show that the idea that all the animals hibernated is not necessary. It's possible, but it's not necessary because why bring food on if they're, if they're meant to hibernate the whole time? So clearly there's enough room. If we said that 100,000 sheep-sized animals could fit, but we only need at most 16,000 animals, there's plenty of room for the food. And also, you mean, well, the big dinosaurs, could. They were the, the big tummies were good for digesting very low-quality uh, plants, material twigs and branches but there's also ways of concentrating the food i mean grains are much more highly concentrated therefore less quantity needed and also less waste product produced as well and one thing that that i noticed is that um you know like we mentioned job chapter 40 talking about behemoth and it says that behemoth um eats grass like an ox Mm, so evolutionists in the past they say that no dinosaurs did eat grass until they found grass in dinosaur droppings Oh, yeah. So they have to say that this huge titanosaurus um, dinosaurs, they actually eat grass. And that was a surprise so, to them, wasn't So they? Noah could have bring hay for these creatures to eat as well, which wouldn't have been the issue. Well, I think also um, hay for the fiber, but I think a lot of it being concentrated just so there's, there's more uh, calories per pound or per kilogram on board. You probably have a lot of dried grains to do it. Um, so... I see hay is, is a lot of roughage and not much in the way of calories, so you bring more grain for the calories. But I think you've got a mixture of both, and there's just no, no problem trying to feed them because the more concentrated the food, the less of it you need. I think in our book, we actually mentioned that um, for food, it will only take up about 15% of the total volume of the ark. Yeah. 
I think this is a conservative, or oh, sorry, a rather generous value that are given. So it could be less than that. Mm. And we also measure water. Um, we do not know if they need to bring water on board the ark, um, but if they had to bring water, 9.4%. So assuming they actually had rainwater, it would be much less than that. I can imagine them just uh, continuing using the rainwater until after the 40 days, the rainwater stopped, but they, they, they store enough to last for the rest of the time, the rest of the year they were on the ark, yeah. So basically 15% for food, 9.4% for rainwater, if they even had to collect that, there's mm-hmm. more than enough space. But Jonah, what about those meat-eating dinosaurs? I mean, again, people have done this this low this low maintenance, low tech uh, way of feeding. You have dry drying drying the meat is a preservative, but also uh, lowers the volume and the mass of the of the meat. So you dry it, and then you reconstitute it with rainwater. So basically, a whole lot of jerky could be made, made possibly, um, and that would actually be enough for the meat eating dinosaurs. But also. Um, you know, the Galapagos tortoise, the giant tortoise, they were in danger of becoming extinct because whalers would take them, turn them upside down, and then, then the, the tortoise would survive like that until they're ready to be killed for meat. So you've got this uh, tor- fodder, giant fodder tortoises as sort of fresh meat storages that would last. Um, so that's a possibility where that's been used um, in in historical times. So dried meat plus fodder tortoises would, would work for, for storing meat for the meat eaters. And we do know that animals were meat eating by the time of the flood. Humans weren't meat eating yet until after the flood. But animals were clearly meat eating at the time of the flood. Yeah, we know that from the fossils. So sometimes we see teeth marks and things like that on the bones. Oh. And even the coprolites, that fossilized poo, that's actually got dinosaur bits and pieces inside it. So they must have gone through the dinosaur digestive system. I think both of us also show a, a picture of a, a T. Rex tooth and a hate and a duckbill dinosaur tailbone. Yes. So the thing survived a T. Rex attack and lived another day, and the thing healed around the bone, healed around the tooth, which got stuck Piercings. in there. Yeah. So yes. clearly survived, but then buried by the flood. So poor thing. But, okay, so one last question. What about the waste? When dinosaurs produce too much waste? Well, a- again, uh, if there's not that many animals, there's, there's only about, um, say, 10% of the ark's carrying capacity of, of animals. Uh, and I think we discussed in the other um, other video we did on, on animals on the ark in general, didn't we talk about things like the, the Hrup style, which is the... Um, gutter the gravity drain gutter system we have a centralized gutter for the waste products you have some sort of flushing system uh, a, a central water uh, source for flushing the stuff into a central holding pit and what you have then you got vermicomposting where you have earthworms that will digest the manure and the earthworms could be actually additional sources of meat for some animals too so that's, that's a, a well-known low-tech thing and even deep litter system because I mean, some farmers through the centuries, low low tick thing. You got animals. You winter them over. You put them in the barn to protect from the winter, and you have deep litter that keeps on piling up, and that absorbs all the waste products. and And it's quite fresh smelling. And the only time it does start to smell is when you when you have to wash it out after the winter. Then you then you then you, know, you notice it's, it's the smell there. But while it's in use, it's actually quite uh, hygienic. And the ark only had to be used once, so. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I think this is assuming that they were not able to wash the waste into the water at all. And we already said that the, that the food only took up about 15% of the volume. Mm-hmm. So if there's space for food, you have the same space for the waste, right? Well, exactly, yeah. And I think uh, it's easy to imagine very low-tech waste or waste holding things, uh, maybe a whole lot of deep litter there and the vermicomposting issue as well. I mean, there are rooms on the ark. I mean, this is the Bible talks about rooms that have, have separate rooms uh, for the, the animals, but I imagine rooms for the people as well would be the thing to do. Yeah, so, Jono, I think we have actually addressed this topic uh, in great detail, how the dinosaurs fit on the ark. If you enjoyed this session, I encourage you to follow us, join us, and do check out this book where both Jono and I actually mm. um, discuss this in a lot more detail. Do you want to open some of the pages to it just to show what, what's in it? Yes, in chapter 14, I think we have an entire chapter that addressed this very question that we talked today. Okay, so that's chapter 14. Did dinosaurs survive the flood? Right. And so we talked about the S-shaped curve that you mentioned earlier on, the bones, mm. how many animals were on the ark. And yeah, the tortoise that you mentioned. So they could have used tortoise for food. 
or similar of any mix. Yes, yeah, so to definitely get out, get hold of our book and look, look at the rest of the resources uh, that we have in the links below in the show notes. And don't forget to like and subscribe to us. Then you'll be notified of, of future talks that uh, us and, and our colleagues will be presenting on different creation-related topics. Okay, so let us know what you think about this in the comments below and we'll see you again. Thank you.